Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you in this, uh, this kind of Facebook Live. Um, I've been looking forward to this day, looking forward to eating and drinking with you, the Lord's Supper, and just uh, spending a little bit of time in the Word now and sharing my thoughts with you about how these last couple of weeks have gone. In the past weeks and now daily on the news, I've been hearing of heroes in the medical profession, people who were, I'm sure, relatively or completely unknown to us before, but now have been hailed and applauded for their sacrificial service. These men and women are actually modeling the way in showing us how to act during a time of national and worldwide crisis. In the book of Hebrews, the writer in chapter 11 enumerates many heroes of faith who are worthy of being modeled because they have paved the way for us. These men and women are the ones we can emulate because in their times of trials and uncertainty, they pass the test. Some of them are named like Enoch and Abraham and Noah and Gideon and Samuel and David and Rahab. Others are unnamed, but their deeds are recorded for us. The writer has a very important point that he wants to make in listing these heroes and their deeds. And he does that at the beginning of chapter 12 of Hebrews. And that's where I want our focus to be this morning. So turn in your Bibles to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3. The writer says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us begin looking at this phrase, so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. This is an amazing phrase of inspiration and confirmation. However, I've often heard that these witnesses are the ones that have gone before us who are in heaven, somehow looking down on us and cheering us on as we go through our earthly existence. Although I love the vision of departed saints cheering me on, the writer does not call them cheerleaders. He calls them witnesses. Again, as we've studied before just recently, the literal word witness in Greek is martyr, a word that English writers later on chose to take to refer to individuals who gave their lives for their faith. These witnesses of chapter 11 are the ones who prove by their faithful actions to us that they are true overcomers. They are the ones who have demonstrated for us how we ought to act during times of uncertainty and trials. We should be applauding them. Next, the writer says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. Lay aside. Last week, we were told to cast our anxieties, to throw our anxieties onto our Father who cares for us. Now we are told to lay aside, as if taking off unnecessary garments and any weights that don't fit in running a race. All the distractions of this life and all the sin that so easily weighs us down, they all need to be laid aside. They are not compatible with racing. They don't belong in the new life we have in Christ. So we must continually 
shed them like a runner preparing for a race. And what is our motivation for that? Well, it's what the writer says next, fixing our eyes on Jesus. The idea here is focus, just like our theme, theme for 2020, 2020 focus on faith, hope, and love. To fix our eyes on Jesus means to evaluate everything in life on the basis that he is our king. It is appraising every intention, every motive, and every behavior to see if it meets the standard of Jesus' life. It is making Jesus the goal of life. As a runner makes the finish line a goal of his or her competition. Jesus was the perfect human. He fulfilled everything that Adam did not. He is our standard of thinking and of action. I once heard these words, heaven is not the goal, Jesus is the goal. Heaven is the place where we want to be because Jesus is there. And when we focus our attention on Jesus, our character becomes more and more like his. Remember, crises will always bring out people's true character, whether good or bad. Let this time be a moment in our lives when we reflect on the parts of our character that need improvement. This then can be a great opportunity for growth rather than a time of static depression. This can be a time of inward strengthening and reevaluation and preparation for a day when the trial is over. The letter to the Hebrews was written just a few years before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The world at that time, especially for Jews and Christians, will be turned upside down. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost that it would involve blood, fire, and smoke, and he used apocalyptic language to refer to it as the sun being darkened and a day that the moon would turn into blood. It was truly a cataclysmic event in the world's history. Over a million and a half Jews were either killed or executed, and because Christians were considered a sect of Jews by most Roman rulers, persecution throughout the Roman Empire became an even more intense for the disciples. So the Hebrews writer wants these Jewish Christians to get ready in their minds for what is about to happen. He wants them to be focusing on Jesus and laying aside anything that would slow them down in their pursuit of him. We, of course, are in the midst of a national and worldwide crisis, health crisis. Certainly not as catastrophic as in those days, but it is a time <clears throat> that I believe we can demonstrate our true character in Christ. You do not want to look back on this time with shame. Seeing a person who was like some that the Hebrews writer addressed as shrinking back. Listen to what the writer says about these Christians in chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If you'll remember, these are the exact words of Habakkuk, who was the prophet before the destruction of Jerusalem, wrote those words to the Jews at that time when the Babylonians were going to come and destroy Jerusalem for the first time. The Hebrews writer is stating now that the Lord is coming again in judgment upon the nation of Israel, and it will be soon. The coming of the Lord was the invasion of the Romans and second destruction of Jerusalem of AD 70. However, the writer then hopefully states this later, but we are not those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have a faith to the saving of our souls. Now look at the words, who for the joy set before him. Everything Jesus endured 
was ultimately for the joy that would come through his efforts. Everything that we endure is for the joy set before us as well. What was that joy that was in front of Jesus? Actually, it wasn't so much what or who. The joy set before Jesus is us. The joy set before Jesus was found in his loud declaration on the cross when he said, it is finished, because redemption had been finished for us. Our Savior raised from the dead. He showed himself to the disciples whom he loved. He embraced them as his very own possession, commissioned them to make more disciples, and was later crowned king sitting at the right hand of the Father. And according to Revelation, he rides on a white horse with a name on the side that says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What great joy was before him. Therefore, we need to recognize and remember the joy that is before us during a time of trial. There is a joy that is inexpressible and a great celebration that is coming because what awaits us is either a joining back together on this earth when this crisis is over, or it's a joining together around the throne of God with one another if he returns before the pandemic ends. How then can we not exult in his holy name? Psalms 105, 1 through 4, give thanks to Jehovah and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exult in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship Jehovah. Search for Jehovah and for his strength. Continually seek him. Twyla Paris writes in one of her most famous songs, He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. Now finally, what the writer tells us we should not do, and that is grow weary and lose heart. Those words are such a graphically and sorrowful way of saying that one is losing hope and hopelessness is the greatest tragedy that anyone can experience on this world, in this world. That is why Jesus elevates us to a different plane beyond this world, because what is in this world and of this world is hopelessly destined for destruction. And that is why we, as Paul says, are raised up with him and are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So who keeps me from not growing weary? Well, of course, it is my Savior. It is what he has done for me personally. It's what he's done for everyone who is in the family of God. But it's also us as we encourage one another. You encourage me. We encourage one another. Hebrews 12, 11 through 13, the writer says, all discipline for the moment is not joyful or seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This is not a time to grow weary. In fact, let's look at this time as a way of preparing our minds for action. This doesn't have to be a time of inaction. Rather, it can be an opportunity to grow our faith and in turn, grow our character in Jesus. And that is why individuals of Hebrews 11 are noteworthy and worthy to be modeled. They grew in faith and acted upon their faith even when they went through the worst trials. Let me say, for the most of us, 
This is an occasion when we may have more time on our hands than ever before. Now, for some in our number, that is not the case. They have a greater burden placed upon them. But for those of us who are basically social distancing and quarantining at home, we have the opportunity to read more, to pray more, to study more, and to meditate more, and then to repeat all four. This can be a time of critical planning for greater service when the crisis is over. What is it that you planned or signed up for in our February ministry fair? That the beginning of the year that you can be fully prepared to execute when the time is right. It can be a time of strengthening our family relationships, especially with your children. Read and discuss Bible stories with your children. Many of you have a Bible or a children's Bible story book in your homes. And if you do not, and you need one, reach out to Alicia or me. We will get one delivered to your house in just a few days. Now, I want us to read Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 15 through 21 together. And I think you will see how it joins with our discussion today. Paul says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. How else do we not grow weary and lose heart? We make the most of our time because the days are evil. Some days and some time periods just don't go as we expect. But the phrase, because the days are evil, does not necessarily mean that sinful activities interrupt our schedules, although they certainly can at times. It also can mean that unanticipated events can disrupt our lives. So we need to be making most of our time. Remember also what I've said before about this counsel that Paul gives us in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, that literally getting drunk is not the only way we can dissipate or reduce our effectiveness as a disciple of Christ. If we binge watch Netflix or game until our eyes become dull or some other worthless activity, then how are we going to understand what the will of the Lord is for us to do during this time? How in the original words of making the most our time, those were literally redeeming the time or buying back the time. How can we do that when we do those other things? Let's buy up the time now. You never know what tomorrow may bring. Let's be like the shrewd stockbroker who looks for the right time to buy, to redeem for his clients the best use of their money. Don't squander or waste this time so that you might look back later on with remorse and say, oh, I could have done that. Or why didn't I do this? Read more, pray more, study more, meditate more, and then repeat all four. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. May God help us to do these things, these very things.
Have a great week in the Lord, everyone. Kirk will now close us in prayer.